Prepare to be illuminated. Hi guys, Skypoint here. A lot of people have been asking me to do an Iron Warriors walkthrough, so here you go. Now the Iron Warriors were actually one of the legions I really enjoy playing a lot. They were introduced in the extermination patch and what they bring to the table is a great blend of powerful tactics, powerful troops with great abilities and also good vehicles as well. The only real downside to the Iron Warriors is they are low they have generally have lower initiative, which is why you don't tend to see them that commonly at the top end of the ladder because most people prefer high initiative up there because they, uh, going first does give you a fairly strong advantage. Having said that, strong and powerful Iron Warrior decks can be found by players up there as well, and so they're a pretty good legion. Alright, so what we're going to do is start by taking a look at their unique mechanic, then their warlords, and then their cards. So beginning with their unique mechanics. So the Iron Warriors bring Siege to the table. So Siege is actually one of the uh, slowest abilities in the game. Uh, if you imagine you play a unit that's turn one, the next turn you will activate its Siege ability, which, uh, which then means that it has to be prepared. So in turn two, its Siege is getting prepared. And then in turn three, it's actually getting to use the Siege ability. A lot of people don't like that. They think it's way too slow. Having said that, most of the Siege abilities are way too powerful uh, to allow every card to activate it all in one turn. But I think the people who say that Siege is pointless kind of miss the point. Because Siege is so powerful that when a unit goes into Siege, it immediately becomes a priority target for the enemy. Meaning effectively what you're doing is putting front line onto the unit. And if you actually get to activate its ability, uh, well, that's pretty much icing on the cake. You're buying times. So people are going to focus on hitting a sieged unit instead of hitting other units. So, um, let's go ahead then and start taking a look at the Warlords. So, I'm going to run through the um, Iron Warriors Warlords uh, in order of effectiveness, which is actually tricky because all of them can be used quite strongly throughout the ladder. Forex ends up being kind of the uh, weakest, especially since Draeger's buff. So let's take a look at Forex. So in common with all of the Orange Rarity Warlords, he has 2 attack and 35 health. His special ability is that he puts in play a barricade, and he has medium initiative. So what's a barricade? So a barricade is a structure, it's actually not from the Iron Warriors list, it's from the Imperial Army list. So let's go down to the bottom and see that. So it's a structure, it ha cannot attack, but it has front line and three health. So basically making a roadblock. Enemies, most enemies will have to get through your barricade before they can attack you. That means that Forex is kind of in a disadvantage. Generally in this game, aggressive warlords are favored, and defensive warlords like uh, Forex can find that, especially by late game, by mid or late game, their defensive abilities are kind of getting overpowered. So that's what makes him kind of less popular. The barricade effect only is useful for the first few turns and then it quickly drops off. Probably next up in terms of effectiveness, although there's one build which is uh, very strong, I'll make a video on that in a moment, is Barbian Falk. Like Forex, he's an orange warlord. He has two attack and 35 health. He does start with an extra card and for one energy, he can give all of his troops plus two attack but he deals one damage to them. So in general, that can actually be really devastating, especially let's say if you have three troops on the board, you activate his ability, those three troops each get plus two attack, meaning in total uh, they're getting plus six attack. So that can make a huge difference. Um, only The only downside is you're damaging your own troops. But um, when I talk about one of the Iron Warriors cards later, I'll talk about how they, be they can become truly devastating with Barb and Falk. There's one card which really benefits from his ability, and there's an entire build called the Falconing, which is uh, dedicated to uh, trying to uh, use that card to full effectiveness. Alright, then now we get on to the more, most common top tier warlords. Narek Draeger used to be really weak, but now he's considered to be very strong. 
So he's a green common warlord, and so he only has 2 attack and 30 health. But he, ha in fact, effectively has 35 health because he's got survivor. So he's right up there in terms of stats with Forex and Falk. Now his, he's got medium initiative, but the real star in here is his ability. For one energy, create a random Iron Warrior's vehicle in your hand, so it goes into your hand, not in play, and give it plus one health. This means Draeger can uh, use any excess energy in the first few turns to start building up some powerful vehicles to play later on. So despite being a green or common warlord, he tends to see uh, a relatively high amount of use among top tier Iron Warriors players. And next on to Perturabo, otherwise known as Peter Turbo. Alright, so Perturabo is the uh, Primarch for the Iron Warriors, and so he has 2 attack and 40 health. He does have a Whispers of Chaos, which we'll look about in a moment, but his ability over here is really cool. It's spend 2 energy and go into Siege, and then the next turn you can deal a whopping 6 damage to a target. So on average, this means every turn you're inflicting uh, 3 damage uh, from your Warlord per turn, which is very similar to the World Eater's Warlord Erlin, except Erlin's special ability only damages the enemy Warlord, whereas Perturabo can choose who his damage gets applied to. He does have low initiative, which is probably the main reason he doesn't get used that often. Now let's take a look at his Whisper of Chaos. So. His Whisper of Chaos is starts at 15 energy, and the cost goes down by minus 1, but only when a friendly Iron Warrior's troop dies during your turn. This last condition is very hard to pull off, and it's one of the two reasons why you don't tend to see that much of um, Perturabo's Whisper ever getting used in the game. In fact, in the whole time I've played the game, I've only ever managed to trigger this Whisper once. And even that was when I was accidentally not trying to do it, but uh, as in, I wasn't planning on having lots of my troops dying in my turn. It happened unintentionally. Alright, so let's say you did manage to trigger his Whisper. You turn him into the Lord of Iron, so you heal up a couple of points. But now his, uh, his stats increase to 3 attack and 40 health. But his special ability now changes. It's still a siege ability, although when you transform, the siege comes loaded, so you can actually trigger it right away. You put in play an iron circle. So I'm going to go and take a look at an iron circle right now. It's a frontline unit with 8 attack and 8 health, but the main problem it has is it, it attacks by itself at the start of its turn. So essentially, I don't like his ability once he's transformed. Maybe the only thing which is helpful is the healing, but uh, aside from that, you lose the devastating direct damage ability and you just gain this put down a front line type thing, which is kind of weak. So because of that, if you're playing Perturabo, I would generally say do not worry about his whisper. It's really hard to trigger and once you trigger it, it's not really worth it at all. His base ability is excellent, just stick with that. Okay, next up, uh, their units. We begin with Dradenor Squad. This guy is actually pretty handy. You definitely don't need Dradenor Squad if you're Forex because you can be throwing out bunkers all day long. Uh, if you're not Forex, Dradenor Squad can be cool. Uh, the nice thing about it is your enemy will put a lot of effort into trying to kill it because a Dradenor Squad can be really annoying because it can throw out a bunker every turn. So as a reminder, a Bunker is this Imperial Army unit with 1 attack, 5 health, and it can't attack. So Bunker normally costs 3 energy, but with Dradenor Squad, you can make them for 2 energy. So it's a neat squad if you're, tr if you're struggling with a cheap unit to put in your deck. This one's worthwhile. Next up, 5th Support Squad. These guys are really cool. So uh, they cost 2 energy and they have 2 attack and 2 health, which is average for that energy cost. But their ability over here, at the end of your turn, deal 2, dam two damage to a random enemy troop. So um, first of all, if the enemy only has... Well, if the enemy has no troops, this will do nothing because it doesn't affect the Warlord. If the enemy only has 1 troop, well, guess who that random enemy troop will be. This is great against Raven Guard, who often rely on a lot of... Um, stealth units often with low health. It can also be used to help finish off units that you've damaged with your Warlord. 
So it's a really great card. I love having these guys and I it's satisfying watching them finish off someone after you weaken them during your turn. Decimation. I personally don't use Decimation because I don't like killing my own units, but uh, there are times when it can be really great and a, a lot of infantry and troop heavy um, uh, Iron Warriors deck will use this card a lot. Really the only down, the, there's only two downsides. You're killing one of your own units. Usually people will try to kill a weak unit which has already taken some damage. And the other downside to this is it actually doesn't buff any troops you've already put in play. Only troops which are in your hand and your deck get affected. Also what this means is that um, anyone who you generate through a tactic or a warlord ability, they don't get affected by this. So Forex doesn't get super strong barricades um, from decimation. But in general, if you're planning on playing a lot of troops, this can be a good card to include because it gives some powerful buffs. Harsh Discipline. This card is one of my favorites. It says give Bloodthirst and deal one damage to a friendly infantry or Astartes troop. So uh, Bloodthirst means the troop can act twice. One damage is obviously a negative, but acting twice is very powerful for troops who have Siege because it means that you can immediately prepare and activate the Siege ability in the same turn. So all of a sudden Siege doesn't become such a huge drawback and the nice thing about Harsh Discipline is this Bloodthirst is permanent so as long as you can keep that troop alive you can keep triggering its Siege ability every single turn. So I like this card, it goes into almost any um, Iron Warriors deck I have where I have troops and I have Siege. There's also a very special use for Harsh Discipline uh, where it combos with Falk and another card and we'll get there in a moment. Olympian Recruits. This card is weak. It's probably one of the weakest cards in the Iron Hands deck. There's kind of no point to these guys. I would generally not include them. There's a lot of other two energy cards you want to have instead. Like Ratcherous Squad. Ratcherous Squad generally doesn't look great on its own. Two attack, only one health for two energy. But the nice thing is when they go into play, a barricade gets dropped as well. So unlike most units with only one attack, they're very likely to survive until their next turn because the enemy will either have to burn a tactic on them or he's the enemy's plow, trying to plow through the barricade that they, these guys just dropped. And two attack is kind of useful. You can use it to uh, either finish off a weak enemy unit or chip away at the health of a powerful one. So Rapture Squad is actually pretty good. Superior Firepower. This is a fantastic tactic. Destroy a troop with three or less attack. Now that applies to a lot of troops out there. Uh, some of the best targets for this tend to be either uh, Jubak Starsight, so the Imperial Army Legendary who co starts copying your deck, or my favorite target for superior firepower is the Helios Mortar character uh, carrier. So if we take a look at that one down here, the Helios Mortar character is an Imperial Army vehicle. It has a big chunk of health, seven health, not much attack, but that's because most of its attack is coming from its direct from its uh, special ability. But seven health makes it usually pretty tricky to kill, but because it only has two attack, uh, superior firepower can just wipe it out immediately. So I like this card. Thirteenth Breacher Squad. This is the first frontline unit we see for the Iron Warriors, and it's pretty good. Four. It costs three energy, so like a barricade. Sorry, sorry, like a bunker. It has four health, so slightly less health than a bunker, but it does have two attack. So many weaker units will die if they tr when they try to hit a breacher squad. And on top of that, it has this cool ability where if, if it survives until your next turn, well, you're probably not attacking with your frontline unit, and it's a shame to leave it doing the nothing at all. So you can spend one energy and make another copy of it ready to go down in your next turn, or even the same turn. So I like 13th Breacher Squad as well. I think it's a decent card. Endemion Squad. So this is the first Siege Squad we see. Um, its stats are actually great, good. It's worth playing just for its stats alone. With 3 energy, it has 3 attack and 4 health. So it's likely to survive 2 turns. Uh, including 2 attacks or attacking once and then the enemy tries to take it out. 
or you can drop it and then next turn activate its siege ability which effectively turns it into a front line because nobody wants to see you get free units going into play so um, they'll try to prioritize taking this guy out so uh, it effectively ends up being a front line f uh, in his next turn as well and if you do manage to activate and use his siege ability you get two of the Olympian recruits coming out which is pretty handy because those guys are doing four damage and with three health they're quite likely to survive for another turn as well so they can really inconvenience your enemy so I like Endemion squad most of the time I play it just for its stats as opposed to its siege ability but if I've got front lines already in play, I may as well try to siege it and see if it survives. Olympia can be a neat little tactic for generating troops. Uh, it puts into, ha into your hands some of the cheaper Iron Warrior troops. Now we haven't seen the 4 cost ones, so they have some excellent 4 cost units. And most of their cheaper troops, apart from Olympian recruits, are pretty cool as well. So it's not a bad little tactic. The only problem is when you're playing it, you're getting nothing to show in that turn for your three energy. But it can be worth keeping in your deck for later in the game when you might have a lot of energy and you, you don't have that many cards in your hand. So this will generate cards for you to play. Precision Bombardment, another excellent, excellent tactic over here. Uh, it costs three energy and does three damage, which is about fair. But if the target dies, this card comes back to your deck and you draw a new card. So you can repeat Precision Bombardment many times during a game and it cycles through your deck and it does a decent amount of damage. This is one of the, my favorite Iron Warriors tactics. I mean, honestly, they've got so many tactics that I love, but this one is great. Rhino77-235 Average stats for its energy costs and a handy useful ability. It draws a Space Marine out of your deck. So depending on your deck build, you can either use this just to make sure you've got more cards coming into hand in order to use, or sometimes, let's say, uh, you can build a deck which relies on pulling a particular troop, and then you, uh, a particular Space Marine troop. So the Falconing deck uses that a lot. Uh, it uses Tarantikos Veterans as the only Space Marine troop in the deck, and to make sure you pull that into your hand, um, you can play Rhino 77 and because it draws an Astartes from your deck, if you only have one type of Astarte in your deck, you're guaranteed to get that. So it's a neat little card, I like it. At the, uh, it getting cards in your hand always helps. Sheathed in Steel. This card most people don't like. I like using it for an Iron Warriors vehicle only deck. Its biggest drawback is for 3 energy you get nothing back except you're drawing a card. So you can only really use it during a safe time in the game. But once you've done that, um, it gives a very significant buff to the vehicles in your deck. Plus 1 attack, plus 1 health can make units very powerful indeed. So I like this but only in an all vehicle deck. And the other thing to bear in mind is it only affects vehicles in your deck. It does not affect any vehicles who, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Narek Drager produces from his ability over here. Store Bezashk. I don't like these guys. Um, in theory, they're kind of like Breach, they, uh, except it produces a troop as well. Deal four damage to an enemy with front line. Obviously that rally ability is not as strong as Breach because the Breach tactic does 5 damage to an enemy although Breach is a tactic so you get nothing left on your board. Um, Storbizax comes onto your board. With only 2 health they're very easy to kill and that's the main reason I don't include them. I mean honestly I probably would have used them more if their stats were 3 energy and then 3 attack and 3 health. But um... I usually find that a lot they're often not doing enough damage to a target with frontline and then they get wiped out easily themselves. So I don't put these guys into my deck. Attrition Warfare. Uh, this is a buff which affects all of your troops which are in play in your hand and in your deck and gives all of your troops, regardless of what type of troop they are, plus one health. That is really powerful. The downside to this and what stops me using it is the fact that it's 4 energy, which is huge. So I think that playing this card puts me too far behind in the game, which is why I don't tend to use it. 
So it's I it's a I, I reluctantly recommend against it because its ability its uh, result is so powerful. But I think you cripple yourself by spending four energy to play this. It's hard to come back even with um, extra healthy troops. Okay, Krendel Squad. This guy is the first of the four energy troops for the Iron Warriors. These guys have average stats for four energy, and then every time a friendly troop attacks and dies, they gain a mark of chaos. So in theory, if you have four friendly troops on the board, you can drop Trendle Squad, and if as long as those four troops die while attacking, these will immediately turn into a greater demon. That, in practice, tends to be pretty hard to pull off, but uh, the Mark of Chaos can be helpful. The main reason I don't tend to include them is, in general, I don't like conditional unit cards, right? I don't like a card which is only, which is uh, extra, which um, benefits only if a particular circumstance is f uh, fulfilled. So the fact that I need to already have another troop on the board in order to really benefit fully from Crendel Squad's ability weighs against it, and I tend to favor the other four cost units uh, from the Iron Warriors instead. Lojos, all right. This is a tactic for the Iron Warrior. It heals your Warlord for four. It also gives plus one attack to any vehicles you put in play for the rest of the game. So this card would be worth it for the heal alone, right? Four energy to heal four health is not bad at all. And uh, the bonus for the vehicles is uh, icing on the cake. This card is critical in a vehicle focused uh, build. The other nice thing about it is it doesn't matter how these vehicles come into your, uh, get played. Uh, so even if Draeger produces a vehicle through his ability, it benefits from the Logos ability as well. So this card is great. I will often include it in my decks uh, for the healing alone. Um, I don't always use the buffing because I'll include it in vehicle heavy, in, sorry, in infantry heavy decks as well. Malbon Squad. These guys have a super powerful siege ability. So destroy an enemy troop. On the downside, they only have three health. And so because their siege ability is so powerful, uh, your enemy will try to kill these guys as soon as they hit the board and there's too many ways for a 3 health space marine unit to get killed so they tend to die. On the other hand, these guys also benefit a lot from harsh discipline because with a zero cost siege ability, if you do have harsh discipline, you can immediately just use these to wipe out an enemy troop. So. Uh, these guys would be nice, it's just that their health is too low to be reliable, so I don't tend to put them in any of my decks. The Bitter End. This is a great tactic. Not only do you get two barricades out of one card, but you also draw a card, so it helps to cycle through your deck while protecting your Warlord and your other cards. So the Bitter End, pretty much all I can say about it is uh, it's a good card to have. It's totally worth it. Uh, it's defensive, it cycles through your deck, and uh, buys you time. I like it. Turbidon Squad. I really enjoy using these guys quite often. Um, they have a siege ability which needs you to spend energy. So I'll usually hold off on these dudes. Um, I'll try to hold off on these dudes until I have a way of triggering them in one turn. But that siege ability, you can see there, is really powerful. It's deal three damage to all enemies. So potentially, if the enemy have six troops out and their warlord, you're talking about 21 damage from uh, one ability over here. Uh, Torbidon Squad is one which I might often play and go into siege with anyway, even if I don't have a front line to protect them or a way of triggering them in one turn. Because with five five health, putting them into siege forces the enemy to spend quite a lot of uh, resources trying to wipe them out. So I like these guys. I know other people don't, and I usually try to trigger their siege whenever I can. When it works, it's often devastating. Tyranticos veterans. These guys are awesome. Now there's a lot going on on this card, so let's take a look. So first of all is Relentless, take one damage. So they suffer one damage at the beginning of each turn that they are alive. That sounds like a big downside. It also means that your enemy doesn't have to just kill these guys. He can leave them on one health and they will kill themselves when their turn starts. But what we're really interested in is their Rage ability. Gain plus two attack. 
So what this means is you play these guys during your uh, during a turn. At the beginning of your next turn, they go down to five health, but they go up to five attack, which is powerful. Now, if you remember though, there's a card called Harsh Discipline. Harsh Discipline deals one damage to a troop and gives it bloodthirst, meaning it can attack again. So let's say uh, you've played Tarantikos veterans. Your next turn starts. They took a point of damage. They're on five health, five attack, and five health. Now you play Harsh Discipline on them. Now they're on 7 attack and 4 health. At that point, you attack the enemy Warlord, and so they take 2 points of damage, but now they go up to 9 attack and 2 health. And then you can attack again with them. So you're doing 9 plus 7, so that's uh, 15 points of damage, I believe. Nope, 16 points of damage off of this one card by playing uh, Harsh Discipline on them. But that's not all. If you remember, Barbin Falk had this neat ability, where for one energy he gives a unit plus two attack but deals plus one damage to it. So let's go back and take a look at Tarantikos veterans and repeat what we did before, but imagine Barbin Falk acts as well. So their turn begins. They're on. They go up to five uh, attack and five health. You play Harsh Discipline. They're on seven attack and four health. Now you activate Barb and Falk's ability, which deals one damage to them, so they go up to uh, nine attack, and then his bonus kicks in, and they're on 11 attack with three health. Now you attack the enemy warlord, dealing 11 points of damage, but taking two points of damage in return, and you're on 13 attack and one health, and you attack the enemy warlord again, and then they die. But in total, the Ranticos veterans has just inflicted 24 points of damage to the enemy warlord in one turn. That is the core of the falconing build. So uh, these guys can be made to be devastating. Just the only downside is um, your enemy will be trying to wipe them out quickly and they don't have to wipe them out totally. They just have to cut them down to one health and then they'll kill themselves at the beginning of the next turn. 30th Heavy Squad. A lot of people don't like this. I actually still do. You need a lot of thinking and planning to make these guys' ability work. So uh, you spend one energy and you deal two damage to a random enemy troop. If you ever manage to get things to the point where all the enemy troops on the board have two or less health, then 30th Heavy Squad can wipe out the entire enemy board for one energy. Even if that doesn't happen, their stats are not bad for uh, 5 energy. They've only got 4 attack, but they have 6 health, and you can just trigger their ability to deal 2 points of damage to a random enemy. And of course, if the enemy only has 1 troop, you can rely on who that 2 points will be applied to. So I do like these guys myself, although a lot of people do not. Ola Scaramanca. This is the first legendary we're seeing for the Iron Warriors. Now. Uh, he's worth it for his stats alone, 5 energy, 5 attack, 6 health, but really you're going to include this guy when you have a vehicle heavy deck, because while he's in play, friendly vehicles have plus 1 attack. The way you normally want to use him therefore, is you want to put him in play after you've, you've put a vehicle in uh, onto the board, so that when that vehicle attacks, it can immediately benefit from the plus 1 attack that he gives. The other ability he has, although this is uncommon because your enemy has to be foolish, although there are a lot of fools in this game, is that if the enemy puts a vehicle in play while he's out there, you can spend 5 energy and take control of that vehicle. A lot of people either don't either forget about this ability of his, or they don't think about it, or they even forget that the type of troop they're putting into play is actually a vehicle. So uh, he's actually pretty decent, uh, he's critical for any vehicle heavy deck. All right, Contrador. This is an awesome card. It is one of the cheapest ways of doing seven damage. Like there's no other card which does seven damage for five energy. Even like Pride of the Emperor, which is the other seven damage card in this game, it costs seven energy. But the reason why Contrador is cheaper is that if you use Contrador, you also give it to your enemy. It goes into their deck. So that's fine as long as you're using Contrador only as a finishing card to kill the enemy once you drop him down to 7 health. But if you're ever in a position where you desperately need to kill a high health unit and you use Contrador, it's going to come back against you later in the game. So just watch out for that. Having said that, um, 
as a finishing card and costing only 5 energy, I think it's critical, so it always goes into my Iron Warriors deck, no matter what. Dominators. These guys are pretty cool. They're kind of like that 4 energy unit we saw before, which gains a bonus when one of your troops dies in your turn. But uh, these guys have a really cool one. They don't buff themselves. They buff any troops who are in your hand. The, that means they can get used to good effect, but honestly, uh, for their energy cost, they've got good stats. 5 attack, 5 health for 5 energy, that's totally average, so they're worth it for uh, their stats alone. But uh, their ability can, be, can give you a huge edge, especially if you've got a large hand of cards and you've got troops dying on the board. These guys will let you uh, convert those troops' deaths into... Uh, uh, a buffed hand of cards. The other neat thing you can do with Dominators is if you read the text, it's when a friendly troop dies during your turn, this happens. It doesn't, those troops don't have to attack, which means if you use Decimation during your turn while Dominators are on the board, those units in your hand are actually gaining plus two to their health stats. Plus one from Decimation, plus also plus one from the Dominators effect. So I've seen Dominators used to uh, f uh, create a follow-up situation with lots of really tough troops. Perturabo's Wrath. This is a one turn only effect, but it gives Bloodthirst to all of your units. This is a neat way of triggering uh, siege effects, as well as allowing you to do lots of damage. If you have a full board full of troops, you can use these to just quickly finish off the enemy by d doubling your damage output. This is a great card. If you if your deck is built with troops or with lots of siege abilities, you can use this to great effect. Promodon. This is a frontline vehicle. It's not commonly used because it only has 4 health for 5 energy, so it gets killed quite easily. It does have a decent attack, but it just dies before it can use that a lot of the time. For 5 energy as a frontline, people will tend to go to the Mechanicum units and grab, for example, uh, Skitari Protector instead, which also has a good anti-stealth secondary ability. So because of that, Promodon generally doesn't get used unless it's been created by uh, Narek Draker, in which case having 5 health is actually quite usable for it. Viral Bombs. This is super unique. It can be really powerful and a game changer. I rarely include it only because it's so hard to set up the conditions right for this. So first of all, it deals 2 damage to everything in play. And then if another troop dies, if any troop dies from that, you do a 1 extra point of damage. And if another troop dies from that bonus point, then you, this ability triggers again and again and again until there's nothing left which is dying from it. So you can sometimes cre uh, implement, uh, do a totally horrific amount of damage with this, and it's usually a great solution to Ornitov's Barge. You know, when you're, when you're beating the enemy, you've got lots of troops in play, but he drops Ornitov's Barge and suddenly he has a ton of troops. Do your maths, check if uh, you'll be able to kill everyone with viral bombs and let them go. In theory, you might kill yourself with viral bombs as well, but the important thing to realize is the way viral bombs works, the game will end as soon as any one warlord is killed from it. So uh, you can trigger viral bombs even if you're going to die from it, as long as your enemy dies first and you, you still get the win. Rack and Ruin. I love this tactic. It's uh, 4 damage for 5 energy, unless you target a vehicle or a structure, in which case that's destroyed completely. So I often use this to uh, against infantry and the enemy warlords for that 4 damage uh, uh, on its own. But if they've got a ve vehicle or a structure out there and they're feeling confident that it has a lot of health, this is the solution. Prime targets for this include Phobos from the, Mount Phobos from the Imperial Army deck. So if we go down and take a look at that thing. Uh, where's it gone? Uh, there we go, Mount Pharos, sorry. Uh, so it's got a whopping 9 health. Well, Rack and Ruin doesn't care because it is, Mount Pharos is a structure, so Rack and Ruin will destroy it. Another great target for it is from the Iron Hands. The Iron Hands have this really terrifying vehicle, Achlis Astra which destroys a random enemy troop at the start of each turn, and it has a shield, so it soaks up the first point of damage, 
Well, Rack and Ruin doesn't care about the shield. It destroys Atlas Astra immediately because it's a vehicle. So I like Rack and Ruin. Okay, next up, Ancient Rend. Again, this is one which other pe I've seen other people dislike. I actually like it because it can mess up with your enemy's plans quite a lot. There are going to be times when you're getting a decent board presence going down, things are going good, and your enemy drops uh, a powerful frontline unit and is hiding behind that. That's where you just pull Ancient Rend out of your hat and uh, he just wipes out that front line and lets you finish things off. So this is a neat ability, I like it. The only downside now is that with Space Wolves being out and including uh, Ward on some of their frontline units, that's as, uh, Ancient Rend cannot destroy a Warded frontline unit, so just watch out for that. All right. Next, Iron Havoc Squad. These guys are cool. So their stats are sort of fish, slightly below average for six energy. But while they're in play, any of your enemy who do an attack will take three damage. And it doesn't matter like uh, if the enemy has sneak attack or not, they'll still take three damage. It doesn't matter if the enemy attacked Iron Havoc Squad and killed it or not, they still take three damage. So that actually puts, uh, uh, that makes your enemy think twice about attacking with many, many units. I mean, it also means that uh, cheap units will just die if they attack while Iron Havoc Squad's in play. So in any uh, infantry focused build, you need to have Iron Havoc. Predator Destructor, or the tank which never dies. This is cool, it's got a fascinating backlash ability that when it gets killed, it goes back into your deck and gets a discount. That's actually important because this card costing six energy means that it's usually starts entering play late in the game when the cheap version of it is likely to come back into your hand out of your deck because your deck size should have been reduced by then. So uh, this vehicle is not bad. Maybe its downside is that it only has five health so it gets killed by a crack grenade very easily but um, either Draeger's ability generating it or using wreathed in steel will help to fix that. So I like Predator Destructor, it's a key part of any vehicle focused our enhanced deck. Forge Breaker, this is the next legendary that we see over here. So it's the weapon card for the Iron Warriors and it hardly ever gets used. Yes, giving plus two to your Warlord could be good, but in general, none of the Iron Warriors Warlords are attacking directly, so they have powerful abilities you want to be using instead. So Forge Breaker's effect never really gets used, except maybe as a defensive move, but they've got better cards for being defensive. So Forge Breaker's a shame, just don't include it in your deck. Land Raider 23-2. This is neat. It's got average stats for 7 energy, but then afterwards, while, while it's alive, any troops you put in play gain plus 1 on their stats, which can be... Uh, which can give a huge advantage. So I like it. If you're going with vehicles, uh, include Land Raider 23 too. Tyrant Terminators. These are an amazing frontline unit. So they have front lines, the enemy must attack them first, and with them having eight health, it takes quite a lot of effort by the enemy to destroy them. They only have five attack, but what these guys are all about is their siege ability. So first of all, as a frontline unit, you're probably not attacking with them energy uh, anyway. So see, the siege ability gets them something to do. But if you have harsh discipline or Perturabo's wrath, you can trigger their siege immediately. And this is powerful. They deal nine damage uh, by attacking a random enemy three times. And especially if the enemy is only has their warlord left, well, that random enemy who takes damage three times is the enemy warlord. So these guys are great in any uh, infantry or uh, in any troop focused deck. I really recommend having Tyrant Terminators, uh, two of these guys. They can really mess up your enemy's day. Erasmus Golg. So he's essentially um, a troop version of uh, Falk. So while he's in play, every turn your troops will gain a permanent plus two to their stats, but they take uh, one damage. So your troops will start dying while he's in play, but get extra powerful, and he's got pretty strong stats on his own. So he's not 
bad, but I usually want other cards in my deck instead to give myself stronger early game presence. So I don't play Erasmus Golg anymore. I used to. He's been useful sometimes, but I'm not super keen on him. Uh, if you have if you if you have him and you don't have enough other legendaries for the Iron Warriors, then by all means go ahead and put him in play. But I ended up replacing Golg with uh, Ancient Rend myself. Um, I just found that being able to reliably wipe out a front line was more useful than giving buffs but damaging my troops. All right, we're on to the last row of cards. Next is Iron Circle. This is a pretty powerful frontline unit, but the main issue I have with it is that it attacks by itself at the start of its turn. So it's not necessarily going to hit what you really need it to hit. So I kind of pass on Iron Circle. Um, for if you really want an 8 energy troop, honestly, Erasmagolg is probably better. Price of Victory is next. Draw three cards. When a friendly troop dies, reduce the cost of this by one. This is actually pretty cool, and you see this getting used quite a lot. Um, uh, it's a way of just replenishing your losses, basically. It's not a bad card to have, honestly. Just have it sit in your hand, and after a couple of turns, you get to pull in a bunch of new cards. Sakaran 2311. So. This card can be really cool. It's the only Iron Warriors card which has either fast or flanks, so the only troop which can act immediately upon entering. Now, uh, what you want to do with this guy is actually, it's, it's actually pretty flexible. You can use it to immediately attack and kill a unit uh, if you wanted, or you can play it and put it into siege if things look relatively safe, and then afterwards it can just destroy any enemy troop. And again, it doesn't matter if they're protected by shield or anything like that. If you can target it, you can kill it. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of the main way you'd end up using these guys. So um, they don't tend to see that much use just because of their high energy cost. Like if they're coming in at nine energy, so if you drop them, you can't really use um, a Warlord ability. I guess Barb and Falk could technically use his one at this point, but um, usually Iron Warriors players have struggled to fill their hat. Uh, it's already tough enough to choose which cards to put in your deck because Iron Warriors have so many good cards. And Sekaran 2317, because it can't really help until the late game, tends to get passed over. Alright. And the very last card, Lathratus. This looks amazing at first, right? Deal 15 damage to the enemy warlord. There's a couple of problems with this, which is why no one seriously uses it. First of all, it costs 10 energy, so you're not able to use any other energy-based abilities on the turn this guy goes into play. Secondly, uh, 15 damage to the enemy warlord sounds good, except you have to go into siege for that, which takes two turns. And if you attack over the course of two turns instead, you're doing 16 damage to the enemy warlord. But more to the point, even if this guy's ever go into play, you're probably going to find it more useful using them to deal 8 points of damage to an enemy target than their siege ability. So you almost never see these guys actually using their siege ability. Honestly, you almost never see them in play either. So these, this ends up being a pass just because it's too expensive for what it really does and it's just too hard to use. All right, so I hope you guys found this useful. The Iron Warriors have great troops, great tactics, great vehicles. It's just the down, main downside right now is their low initiative. The other thought which I have is that right now the Iron Warriors have a lot of great targeted tactics. And if the new ward mechanic which was introduced with Space Wolves uh, starts getting more popular among players or more factions get it, that starts to limit who the Iron Warriors can actually directly target, which might affect them in the same way that Sons of Horus get affected by uh, ward and um, targeted tactics and abilities. All right, so I hope you guys found this useful. Uh, remember to subscribe when you get notified when uh, I continue doing guides. I think Raven Guard is probably even yeah, Raven Guards is probably the next uh, Legion I need to do, and then after that I'll be doing um, Alpha Legion and Night Lords properly as well. All right, so I hope you guys uh, enjoy this video. Stay tuned, subscribe, and more will be coming. Bye for now.